All right, everybody. I haven't done a live stream for a while now, and I thought it would be a great time to bring back my old friend, Jello, who you guys may know. He's the host of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You may also remember that Jello was on the channel some months ago. Let me find the, uh, the thumbnail here. September, I believe it was. I'm not that old, by the way, Mooch. Yeah. So you, me, and Hoser were at Hook um, and just chit-chatting, actually violating mask protocols <laughs> at the Nugget. But, uh, you know, that's how we roll. We're rebels. And uh, we had a fun chat. But if people remember that episode, we connected the dots between you and me. So not only have you been uh, a lamplighter in terms of the YouTube piece you and i cruised together back when i was cag ops and you were a cat one in uh remind me you were in 82 or 86 Six. 86. Yeah, 86 yeah was size was size your co he was yeah so bill sizemore who went through the rag with me back we're both cat ones um so see they all the dots all connect here <laughs> so jell and i don't just know each other from the youtube space we also know each other from the fleet which is always uh great for for the cred but when I was first getting this channel going, uh, you know, more than a year ago, I went to you because our good friend, Buzz Snodgrass, another Top Gun guy, um, had said, hey, you got to check out Jello's Fighter Pilot podcast. And then you guys should talk. And this is before the YouTube, my YouTube channel existed. And so um, the episode I had just seen at that time was you analyzing the most recent Top Gun Maverick trailer. And for starters, if you watch my channel and you're not subscribed to Jello, you're making a huge mistake um, because his format is plenty deep dive. He's got an eye on history. He does type model series and he goes deeper than I do on my channel. Um, it's a straight stick podcast and occasionally he'll do a, a YouTube episode as well. But definitely subscribe to the Fighter Pilot podcast in audio form and also Jello's YouTube channel. So that's let's get that out of the way for starters. But most recently, Jello did a, it's a really cool idea where you got a sponsor to get you and your posse to rent out a theater in San Diego, and you, you did a special exclusive showing of Top Gun Maverick. And then you had some subject matter experts, which were fellow Top Gun instructors, because the other thing to note is Jello is not just a YouTuber, he's a Top Gun instructor alum, you know, so he doesn't just play one on YouTube, he's actually one in real life. Um, and he's a legacy Hornet guy and flown other type model series. So we wanted to bring him together to talk about um, Top Gun Maverick in terms of what we liked and what was potentially borderline cringeworthy. I have some, some specifics. And to that end, I wanna go ahead and put up this warning because a lot of people were puling, as we say in the fighter business, when I did my review about, hey, that sounds like a spoiler, which I still stand by the idea that it's not. Anything I did in that review episode was not a spoiler, ultimately. But this one, I guarantee you, will contain some spoilers. So what we're doing here is this is aimed for people who we think have already seen the movie, right? Jello, is that kind of what we're thinking? Sure. And so we want to talk about it in, in sort of broad strokes. So Jello, welcome. Thank you. Oof. There's a huge mooch <laughs> prolix. I, I feel important suddenly. Oh, you are important. You're definitely oh, important. You. So um, let's just talk overall impressions of the movie. So how many times have you seen it now? Is it twice? Have you seen it twice? Three, actually. Three times, okay. Yeah. I've seen it twice. I took the wife to see it last week here in Annapolis. Good. And uh, as my channel followers know, I saw it in New York some weeks ago, a Paramount sent me up there. I, I acted like a big city elitist and I took the Acela back and forth in a single day to walk 30 blocks and see the uh, the movie. And so it was better for me the second time. How did you feel with subsequent viewings? I liked it every time, but uh, by the third time, I thought I might get through it without crying. And I'm sorry to say I didn't. So uh, I love the movie. I, it's, it's good entertainment. So, um, Let's just go through sort of the chronology and, and, and we'll, we'll drop anchor on some parts. So let's start with the opening theme. What were your impressions about the way the movie started? I was curious how they would do that because it is so iconic in the 1986 Top Gun where you hear the 
first couple beats of Harold Faltermeyer's song. And then it cuts to the flight deck scene. And I thought, okay, what are they going to do here? And so sure enough, they use the exact same 1969, right? The Navy did this. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, yeah, we read all that the first time, but okay. That, you know, now I'm, I'm on familiar territory. So yes, this all sounds right to me. And then of course, boom, you get hit with a logo and then the a little, little stinger at the bottom. And then it's a modern day flight deck, very reminiscent of 1986 but all modern flight operations with a cameo from the F-35. I thought that was cool. Yeah, like the cameo of the A-6 tanker and the A-7 in the first <laughs> exactly. one, right? Exactly. Um, that's where they get their, their due. But uh, yeah, I was surprised. And I didn't know what the soundtrack, because the soundtrack was such a big part of the first one, uh, what it would include. But I think ultimately that was a good call because that song just, it's part of all of our lives um and uh i i was moved you know i was like oh okay i'm home this this feels right it's not redundant or it's not a cop out creatively i thought it i thought it worked so then we open in mav's hangar slash house in the mojave desert right kind of a cool cool pad mm-hmm. you know um bachelor pad bachelor pad kind of a badass uh, place to, to hang out where his P-51 is parked and he's got motorcycles on the uh, the walls and stuff, you know, kind of a cool thing. And Mach 7 is, or Mach 9 is circled on the, on the calendar, right? So he winds up doing this SR-72 scene. What were your thoughts about that? Because some of our, let's call them colleagues, have had a big problem with, with that part of the movie. What did you think of that? Well, I don't ever remember hearing the term SR-72. They do say Dark Star and you do see the little skunk. So we know that Lockheed Skunk Works was involved. And in fact, there are some articles floating around that uh, apparently one of our less than friendly countries uh, that keeps uh, surveillance on us uh, rerouted a satellite to take a look at what is this thing down there not knowing it was a movie prop. So I thought that was pretty entertaining. Um, But just, you know, taking a step back, Mooch, let's all just slap the table and say, it's a movie. It's not a documentary. It's entertainment. Yes, it parallels real life. And yes, there's a lot of reality in it. But there's also a lot of things that aren't real. So he's ostensibly at VX31, testing some hypersonic craft. And it's Mach 9. But here comes the old grouch to uh, shut us down. So okay, fine, let's go to Mach 10. And uh, I thought it was well done. I mean, it's, it's a very believable mock-up that they built with the help of skunk works and the flying is beautiful so this introduces a question about maverick's career path um because if he's in the test community as you and i know um that generally means he's gone to test pilot school um in in patuxent river in southern maryland south of where i am right now and that can mean a pivot from the operational world to the aviation engineering duty officer world, the AEDO world. And these folks get into procurement and acquisitions and they hang out at Pax River and they go uptown to DC, but they don't go on deployment anymore. So, and let me once again, put up this banner so people don't freak out. I think I'm about to do a spoiler here, right? So Penny Benjamin's at the bar and she's kind of recounting his career. And she's like, yeah, Iceman was your sea daddy. He kept you out of trouble and you went to Bosnia. Right. And then you went to Iraq and so forth. All right. So what we know about Mav from the first movie, he's in the squadron. He gets the nod to go to Top Gun. He does Top Gun. He goes back for one sortie where he shoots down three MiGs. And then he goes back to Top Gun, right? So that's a really short Cat 1 tour. Well, hold on. So remember pre-1996, Top Gun was something you did in the middle of your Cat 1 tour. So theoretically, he uh, saves Cougar in the first movie. Cougar was going to get the nod to be the guy who leaves his squadron to go to Top Gun, but he turned in his wings. So you two characters instead are going. So he goes to Top Gun and then theoretically goes back to his old squadron and has the climax scene there that we all know about. And then he's maybe at the end of his tour, or at least, you know, hey, let's let's just cut from here to here uh, and, and squeeze it together. But 
hey, your choice of orders anywhere in the world where you want to go. Oh, I thought I might be an instructor. And who knows? Maybe he thought he'd go back and, and make right with Charlie. But um, he leaves his first J.O. tour and his first shore tour will be as a Top Gun instructor. Okay. So let's just say that that you make a good point there. And so let's say that that's normal. And then at some point, as recounted by Penny Benjamin, he goes to Bosnia, which I did a Bosnia thing when I was a department head, 95, 96, the great Bosnian war on America, which I think predates your time in 86. Uh, there was the cruise before you joined, or were you on that cruise too? No, my first deployment was the 97 deployment. Okay. Um, so we decommissioned America. The air wing switches to George Washington, which, oh, by the way, I did the shakedown on GW back in 92. This brand, Cherry New, had that new carrier smell. You know, we had a good time down in the Puerto Rican op area with a, a, a small debt. Um, so I go way back with GW. And so he's on. So let's say that that would be his super J.O. tour when he's doing the Bosnia thing. Or is he a department head there? Right. So which Probably department head? Because that's about a decade after. If, if we're using real human years here, not dog years or whatever else. <laughs> uh, 1986 movie comes out modern day, let's say. It does say present day, right? In one of the Indian Ocean. It does. Day. It does. Uh, so he's a J.O. in 86 and uh, 1986. And so by 19, what'd you say? 95. That's 10 years later. He could probably be a CO actually. But yeah, let's call it department head. Okay. And so then let's just say, again, using Penny Benjamin's conversation at the bar, then let's say it's his CO tour. When he did, and I guess it would be what Operation Southern Watch kind of a thing that we like kind of circle what we did. Uh, maybe I mean let's let's first acknowledge that we're kind of nerding out right now, of course, Mitch. So we're we're yes, trying to we're make real out. world out of this notional world summarized in uh, ten seconds. Uh, that's movie, what people but... tune in for. They want okay. us to nerd out. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean he could have been right in oh uh, one. We were in Afghanistan. By oh three, we were in Iraq again. And so maybe when she sees him in present day, assuming it is, well, actually two years ago, because they didn't assume uh, COVID, but when she sees him, yeah, he could have been 03 to 05 type of time frame for Iraq. Okay. Okay. So let's just say this is all okay. And then let's just say post CO, which this is the not okay part, he goes into the test community. Somehow he's flying this dark star in the desert. Um, so I guess he punted on TPS and just was a by name call. Hold on, hold on, Mooch. Can I interrupt? Normally yes, I would do this. Yes, of but course. Do you remember he says, I forget to whom, that he only lasted as a Top Gun instructor for a couple months. So maybe he needed a home and maybe he went to TPS for his first JO short tour. His split short tour. So he went from Top Gun to TPS. I no, I like it. See, we're we're making it real, you okay. know. So he actually did have a real career path, and so now he's this Terminal 06 kind of guy. So I'm not thinking he did the CAG thing or anything else. So he has enough momentum to make 06, but as described by the Ed Harris character, um, he's, you know. He's not, won't die, won't get out, so forth and so on, right? Yeah. And so here we go. Um, I will tell you, I liked that part. I thought it was visually amazing um, in terms of the look, right? This this blue-black sort of hue thing going on. It was sort of really visually stunning in the Dolby widescreen. So I liked it. Um, we also got to meet the Hondo character, the, the warrant officer Hondo guy, right? So he's the first of several blissfully ill-defined characters who wander Side around. Sidekicks, Mooch. Sidekicks. Sidekicks. Sidekicks, right? He's absolutely a sidekick. So I thought, because he, he's part page to Maverick's Knight, part drill sergeant when they start doing push-ups, which we'll talk about in a second. Um and then there's this sort of teary-eyed moment at the end. You're like, please come home to me, Maverick. You know, and I, like you, was moved. I got I to gotta say, I'm not going to lie, you know? So, okay, I like it. We've answered the questions about this career path. It's viable in the real world, albeit 
unorthodox. Um, then there's the ice as sea daddy part, which makes sense to me. We've all had sponsors, you know, at some time. This is why it's good to be um, admired and respected by your chain of command. You know, and the way you do that is to work hard and, and do the job well. It's not kissing ass. Um, it's be, you know, a competent J.O. And then that projection, if we as we've seen, you know, Sea Daddies can last an entire career, really. Um, and this is just part of what makes the business special. I don't think that there's anything sycophantic about it um, or, or somehow nepotistic about it. Um, it's just networking. So to me, I was cool with the idea that, that Admiral Kazansky was Maverick's Sea Daddy. Sure. I mean, obviously, he accelerated through the ranks, which I have some heartburn with based on his shall we say, attitude and ego in the first movie. Um, but maybe he turned it around or maybe that served him well, which it sometimes can in the military. So so the John Hamm character, and I didn't notice this the first go around. Uh, and in my review, I'm like, but John Hamm introduces himself at that first, uh, you know, stand up with Maverick um, that, hey, I'm the air boss. And then the other guy, Warlock. Warlock was mm -hmm. nautic i missed that the first go round. okay right so that makes sense to me um in terms of nautic which we used to call nsoc back in the day um is the parent organization of top gun now in fallon not in miramar where it was located in real life and also in the first movie but in this movie it's in north island for some reason right there we're suddenly in north island yeah so Cool. cool I, I think they, I think they wanted to the film there. It's more visually stunning than Lamar or Fallon. Right. And again, it's a plot mm, side note that they can make without uh, hopefully hurting too many people. Yeah, and that's not quite cringeworthy. I mean, okay, so Top Guns at North Island. Um, many of the so scenes. So Pack Fleet apparently. What what and as as with Pack Fleet right and yeah. and uh, so <laughs> there's no nothing in Hawaii, nothing in Fallon. Everything's at Coronado. Which actually, as you're a San Diego guy, that probably worked for you. You know, if you had to be stationed somewhere, it's better to be at Coronado than uh, in Fallon, for sure. But the jet guys weren't smart enough. Everything in Coronado is formerly the uh, S3 community and now the H60 community and the CODs and the CMB22. So they all got it smart. We, yes. we must be affected by all the Gs. We, we never get the garden spots. Although I can't complain because I lived in Virginia Beach for most of my Navy career. Um, okay. So, um, okay, let's, let's talk about, so he quickie, they're like, Hey, here's the problem. It's this, uh, uh, uranium enrichment facility. Okay. Ready? Go Maverick. Give us a mission plan. So how did you, how did you like that setup? Well, I mean, if he'd been in the test community for a while, I, I, it's good on him for keeping sharp on tactics, but uh, I, I thought the dismissive hand wave of the, oh, $100 million F-35 is useless uh, because of GPS jamming. I thought that was kind of funny. And then, yeah, I guess, you know, if it's a robust surface-to-air threat, getting under that, you know, so instead of suppression, it's surprise, is probably a good idea. But, yeah, flying down into this bowl and the consecutive miracle thing, pretty challenging, but that also made for a compelling movie. So Luke asked a good question here. And this goes back to the opening scene where his man cave in the Mojave Desert, um, he's got a P-51 park there. So a fair question. How did Maverick purchase a P-51? Did he invest his savings in Bitcoin? Well, I think since the bottom has fallen out of Bitcoin, he probably didn't do that. Plus when he was a 04, 05, there was no such thing as Bitcoin, right? So I don't know the... We don't know who Mav's parents are, you know, um, so who knows, right? But that's a fair question. Um, so the mission analysis, two plane, and it's a buddy lay situation. So an E with an F. Um, I kind of like that being a Rio. I like to get my Wizzos involved here. I know one of your guests on your panel was cool with that idea. Right. So Buddy Lazing's a thing. We did it quite a bit before we had Lantern in the, in the Tomcat in the Bosnian uh, situation. We were an extension of the Legacy Hornets wing where we dial in the laser codes and they'd say pickle, pickle, pickle. And we didn't have any 
guidance and you guys were using your lightning pods. And then subsequent to that, we used the lantern pod with buddy lasing for other things. So that's kind of a cool idea in concept. And as your panelists mentioned, you know, pilots would kind of like their NFOs heads down while, while they can stay out of the cockpit, right? So you're looking for man pads and you're making sure you don't tie the record for low flight by hitting the mountain and that kind of thing, right? So I, I like that concept. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was okay. Uh, one small correction. We had Nighthawk pods, not Lightning pods, at least. Okay, Jill, are you hearing me? I, I, you're muted. You went, you went on mute. We're having a little technical error with Jello's audio here. You're you're muted. You got mute. Your mic is muted. Well, if this, if this sounds all right, we can just keep going. Yeah, that air no, we're good. Or something. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're cool with the buddy lays part. The thing that I wanted to ask you. So if I'm carrying, let's say a GBU 12. Okay. Right. And so I, I roll in, which you wouldn't do, right. There's, you're not, there's no dive angle. You're dropping uh, precision guided munitions. Um, but uh, I go, what did he call dead eye? What was the, the call when the, the FLIR is, is not behaving? No, I think that is. And I believe that's a correct calm brevity term. So, but then would your HUD presentation give you a drop cue for like a dumb bomb release? Like Rooster winds up dropping his bomb like a dumb bomb, right? Because yeah. they're going dead eye at the roll in. I don't know, did he have Fanboy or Bob, whoever the Wizzo was in the wing airplane? I think it was Fanboy. Um, and, and so he does a ballistic drop as if it was a regular Mark 80 series bomb. Is that realistic? Is that something you could pull off? Yeah, it is actually, because when you tell the aircraft what you're carrying, it will give ballistics for that. And so the fact that we usually drop it straight and level is somewhat immaterial. If you decide to roll in and have a dive, then it will still give you the ballistics. And when it thinks the release point is there, then it will do it. In the movie, all we see is the velocity vector pointing at the target. We don't see any release cues or any other air to ground symbology. And again, Mooch, Guys like you and I are going to pick that apart. Folks like who are dialing into this are listening. Maybe you want to know that because they're military aviation enthusiasts. The rest of the world doesn't care. <laughs> no. And, and so that's the proviso. That's the caveat. Right. We are nerding out. I, I loved how your guests and I entreat the viewers to watch that episode you just posted uh, with the guests because there is there's a lot of detail. that's very cool. Um, and, and it's not really spoiler. It'll, it'll help you enjoy the movie more, I'm going to say, um, because of your smees. But what struck me right from the get-go is nobody gave it worse than a nine and a half out of 10. And this is a Tomcat guy, a Hornet guy, Super Hornet guys, right? These are the insiders that are like walking away like this is a really good movie. Yeah. So the cringe, which I've made kind of a cottage industry out of making fun in a loving way of the first one, right? 79 cringeworthy errors, I think is the most read thing I've ever written uh, in the history of my, my writing career. Um, but there were, and with each watching, it got more and more campy. This one doesn't have it. The continuity things work in terms of the flow of the airplanes. It's not just a whole bunch of stuff thrown together visually that doesn't make sense from shot to shot, you know? And I really did, focus on that the second time I watched the movie to go, okay, is this airplane still in a right turn with the next edit? And it was, you know, so in terms of keeping track of what is going on, even with the most simplistic concepts, like Rooster doesn't want to go too fast. It sort of felt like Maverick won't engage right at the end there. It's kind of like, you need to go faster. And he's like, talk to me, dad. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then suddenly he's like, going supersonic through the, you know, wheedling through the, the valley there. Um, so obviously that was just done for 
the, the theatrics of it. Um, but again, concepts that folks can understand just being a casual movie goer. I'm cool with that. As Tony Scott said, I don't make movies for fighter pilots. I make movies for moviegoers. And I think Joe Kaczynski is of the same sort of uh, tribe with respect to that. So, okay, cool. Right. But meanwhile, we're going to sort of cheap shot a few things here in this particular live stream. Um, so how about the training program? Right. So he starts with the air to air stuff, then some air to ground stuff. What were your thoughts about that? Well, first, let's take a step back. So they recruit the dream team of recent Top Gun graduates. Now, in the first movie, our heroes are going through Top Gun. But in this movie, the dream team they call up are all recent Top Gun graduates. And the, the contention I have with the storyline is that they all show up somewhat uh, hapless, I feel like. And it's like, oh, first you're going to dogfight, and then you're going to do low levels, and then you're going to do pops. I did all that in the training command for FA-18s. And before I went to Top Gun, and by the time I got done with Top Gun, I was good at it. And oh, by the way, I was better at it when I was a lieutenant fresh out of Top Gun than any 06 they could have called and brought back. So that was like, okay, here's this guy who's just been doing training stuff, uh, sorry, testing. And now he's going to come back and teach me. And that was one of my questions to my only active duty panel member who is an air wing commander in an 06. And I knew him when he was a lieutenant. He was tactical. And he took my bait. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm way, way worse now than I was before. And those guys were teaching me because they're coming from that recent training. And the movie just kind of portrayed them as, oh, we just look good and show up, but we don't really know what we're doing. And, and so I, I took some issue with that. But to the point of your question, yeah, anytime you have something difficult to do, baby steps, walking and tackling, whatever you want to call it, start with the basics, work up to the graduate level material. So, Mike, just want to thank you for the super chat. Um, this is always very appreciated, everybody. Harry Lime as well, one of our regular uh, supporters, also a patron. Uh, Harry, uh, as always, shows up with some good support. So thank you, Harry. So good points there with respect to their attitude, because like you said, I didn't think of it until you said it. They're kind of hapless, like, ah, what's a 1v1? And Oh my God, now we're doing push-ups because you just kicked our ass and that sort of thing. So that was another potentially cringeworthy thing. Now I know, and we'll keep the who out of it, but um, that was going to be even cringier. The push-ups part is what I'm talking about. But uh, a good friend of ours who was one of the military advisors said, okay, because originally the script was written that Maverick was the one who said, hey, if I beat you, you guys do push-ups, right? And then the military advisor goes, how about if one of the coneheads, yeah, one of the lieutenants, yeah. um, and so Coyote uh, is like, hey, if we beat your ass, old man, you do push-ups, and then the next scene is they're all doing push-ups, and Hondo now is the drill sergeant guy, um, and Rooster won't stop doing push-ups because he's so intense, you know, um, and so, you know, again, under the construct of the movie, that was fun. I liked it, but I've, you know, I've never done any push-ups on the flight line. I haven't either. And I wonder about you, uh, Mooch. I bet you could do 200. It would take me probably a week, even when I was in my prime. Yeah. Let's, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. As far as we know, I could do 200. Okay. Um, gotcha. Eventually I'd do 200, right? How much time okay. do you give me? Yeah. Right. It took me the three weeks they had for training, but I think, yeah. yeah. These, anyway. Yeah. So good points. These are seasoned top gun graduates so the other thing about it they're swifties right so these are your squad and training officers for having gone through you know so their latest and greatest tactics and they just show up like you know and that's where phoenix is like we're the best of the best so who's going to teach us i hate you know? that line so so okay but under the because that's something as we're guessing you know as we're doing our okay here's the trailer like a year ago what is this i thought that mav would be brought back to be a Top Gun instructor, he'd teach this class, and then the graduates that he taught would go off and do some mission. That was my guess. Okay. So I actually like this sort of setup better, where they're yeah. they're all grads, you know. And I, I love seeing the puking dog patch on Fanboy, having been a former puking dog. Were any of your squadrons in that in that array of patches? I think it was Coyote was wearing my VFA eighty six patch. Very well. Yeah. So they got the patch thing right this time on last, unlike last time where it was sort of this just walked out of the Navy exchange 
after randomly grabbing stuff, <laughs> going to the, the sewing lady, hey, can you put these all on yeah. my patch? Wherever you want. Don't worry well, about where you put them. Even before Maverick jumps on his motorcycle to go do Mach 10, he throws on a jacket that's got a CBs patch. I'm like, yeah. When were you in the CBs? And you don't <laughs> put random warfare community patches on your jackets, people. It's not what we yeah. do. So I don't, some have said that was his dad's flight jacket, right? Or his, okay, parents, let's go you know, again, the whole family, anybody who ever remotely knew anybody would put a patch on there. So, sure. yeah, again, the first movie had a lot of cringe with just, let's call it under the header of patches. This one did much better with respect to that. Phoenix was a VFA 41, Black Ace. Yeah, you know, old Tomcat Squadron. Um, first Gulf of Sitter was those guys. Okay, so now we get to the mission. Um, how did you like how Maverick was first booted and then became the guy who did the mission? Well, so first off, the air boss is the antagonist, and he has his own sidekick, the Nautic Commander, who evidently have nothing better to do than uh, be around everywhere, including on the carrier in the middle of some uh, presumably very far away ocean. Uh, but that is needed for continuity, right? I don't make movies or write stories, but you need the comic relief. You need the hero. You need the third act slump. You need the antagonist. You need all these elements to make this movie. And so he has to play that role. And it's clear he's got disdain for Maverick for whatever reasons, which by the way, they should have been peers younger days, right? Because we hear from Ed Harris's character, Admiral Kane, that Maverick should have been a two-star admiral by now. And so the air boss is three. His buddy, they were both lieutenants. Iceman is four. So this uh, John Hamm character, the air boss, should have been somebody he already knew. I mean, I don't know about you, Mooch. You probably, you probably did know everybody. I felt like I knew most people, even on the opposite coast, who were around my year group and were flying. And this guy, the air boss, would have been flying probably F-18s or something similar also. So... They act like they don't know each other. Maybe they've got some bad blood. I don't know. Um, but here he is. Uh, now that his sea daddy has passed, well, then I can do whatever I want now. I'm going to fire you. But, oh, wait, I'll just go steal a jet. So I'm, I'm getting ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, again, some some tension. You got to have tension in the plot, in the arc of the plot. Um, I That was my thought, too. It's like you're telling me these guys have never met. In fact, I imagine if Maverick, and you do the math, let's just say this movie was originally supposed to come out in 2018, right? Um, and uh, so um, that means that he had been in for 32, 34 years, right? So it kind of makes him my year group, maybe a slightly junior to me. Um, and so my peers are all four stars and out now, right? So it'd be more like Iceman, which is what... So basically... Um, Mav is senior to, in terms of years, to uh, Cyclone, right? So that, I, I agree. It's like, I've, ne I've never met you. I don't know who you are. I I've heard about you by reputation. Also, that none of the students knew who he was, right? Or the, we're calling them students. The cat ones knew who he was, right? So you walk into, this is everything like the mystery of who Maverick is. You walk into Air Pack, and there's a gigantic picture of Iceman and Maverick shaking hands on the flight deck. Yeah. Right? Fan service. Like, who is this mystery guy who we've seen every time we've gone to Air Pack? Yeah. You know? Who, by the way, is a three, uh, sorry, yeah, a three time mid killer on active duty. I'm pretty yeah. sure I would know who that Yeah, is. right. You know, so it'd be like, again, before Duke became a, a felon. But maybe um, maybe you know, he went Duke, off the grid. Cunningham to walking into the Oak Club. Everybody knew who Duke was. Right. And when Randy Driscoll walks in now, we all know who he is, you know. But Mooch, maybe he went off the reservation in a sense to test the Dark Star. OK, well, I mean, OK, we do know that when people go ADO, they disappear from planet Earth. Right. Unless you live in and around Patuxent River in, in St. Mary's County, then it's its own little community where they don't know anybody else. You know, um, I know this because I worked down there for a few years. It, these are two separate worlds right that do support each other but once you're in one thing you're not in it and another thing so okay I, I guess that's possible right um so we get to the mission another thing now suddenly the air boss is on the carrier right and so is hondo warrant officer hondo is on the carrier and so is nautic on the carrier so this is like the first movie where the bald guy was everywhere and did everything right is he cag is he ship co is he 
squadron CO. So is the air boss, is he, you know, fleet commander? Is he, is Nautic actually the strike group commander, right? They're all playing these. Here's how I swallow this, Mooch. Uh, This tasking is so important that the air boss has been given this. This is all you will do tasking. Forget about all the other things the air boss does. Um, You're going to make sure this team is trained to take out this facility. And here's your sidekick, the Nautic commander to do it. Don't worry about anything else. Blow up that facility. Now, if you go with that unbelievable setting, it could work. No, I, I like it. I like it. So here's a question from Jason. Is it possible for Iceman to be the head of Pacific Fleet? Isn't that position more for extremely experienced sailors working up the ranks? Well, it yeah, it's highly possible. I mean, the current Pacific Fleet is our good friend Sam Paparo, um, who is – Kind of like that profile, you know, a fighter guy has Tomcat time. He's one of the last Tomcat experienced guys, Super Hornet time. So he would kind of fit the mold of what Iceman is, right? So I, I'm I'm cool with Iceman being um, Pack Fleet, right? I don't have any trouble with that. The, the thing that is sort of um, sudden is his illness, right? So Mav... You know, they're text exchanging. I need to see you. Not a good time. I'm not asking. He shows up to the house, which is this gorgeous house overlooking the bay um, or the ocean, I guess. And, and uh, the wife shows up um, at a central casting and like he's not well. It's not good. Right. And Mav has no idea kind of that he's sick, really. You know what? Uh, he's sick? It's back. I think he asked. Right. So clearly. He oh, it's back. Bout. Yes. Good. He point. had a bout with cancer before. And maybe overcame it, got to stay in the Navy, maybe not flying at that. Well, certainly not at that rank. But, okay, it's back, and it's it's fast, and he can't talk. Look, Mooch, they got to see Iceman. The, the, everyone on this call and everybody else has got to see Iceman and Mooch together. We need that closure and redemption. There's no way they're going to – as long as Val Kilmer is, is kicking, uh, we're going to work, work with his uh, issues that he's had health-wise and figure it out. So I will say – I, I was moved with their final parting where they hugged. And then I thought it was a brilliant line where Iceman, and I think this was not really his voice that was, you know, overdubbed where he's actually talking. Now, as I said before in my review, I recommend you watch the movie Val, the documentary Val, because it explains yeah. Yeah. a lot about his sickness and how he's dealt with it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we dismiss Val Kilmer because of, because, you know, his Iceman, or we, we dumb him down. He's really an artist, let's just say, that yeah. takes the craft very seriously. Um, so he's kind of method. And I, I thought that scene was really well done. And then at the end where he's like, who's the better fighter pilot? And and Mav says, this is a beautiful moment. Let's not wreck it. I thought that was a great line. Let's not ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the only thing is, uh, Mooch, you probably rub elbows with more admirals than I do. But yeah, there- probably. Something happens to young people like you and me, and we're not that young anymore, by the way. But when you become an admiral, I don't know if they do some sort of little lobotomy thing, but suddenly you don't care about petty stuff anymore. You care about big strategic things, particularly as the admiral of the Pacific Fleet. I felt that was fan service, a a nod back to the old competition that those two had, that a real four-star pack fleet dying man wouldn't care about. But it broke the tension. So it allowed people like you and me to surreptitiously. Ah, that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to so lie. I, I, wept. I thought it was I brilliantly wept. done and whether it was his real voice or not, don't care. Um, that in fact, my favorite line, favorite scene in the whole movie is when Maverick brilliant actor, Tom Cruise, I should say brilliant actor is trying to let go. Right. And you can see his face and demeanor changing. And man, actors are amazing. I don't think I could do this. But you see him bringing all this repressed feeling to the surface. Like, I don't know how to let go. And he says the line, I love it, Mooch. I'm a fighter pilot now. You can change it for Naval Aviator or whatever, or or, or Naval Officer. But I'm a fighter pilot, a Naval Aviator. It's not what I am. It's who I am. I get chills thinking about that because that is why I started the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I couldn't walk away from 25 years of doing this with people like you and say, eh, I'm done. You know, what are we having for dinner tomorrow? No, man, it is part of you and it's hard to let go of some of it. And 
maybe people will say the same thing to me. Jello, you've been five years out of the cockpit. And now you're still doing the fighter pilot podcast. No, no, no. I enjoy it and people like it. And we seem to be making a difference. And so I love that scene. That, that was my favorite. Even of all the flying scenes, that's my favorite. That's my second favorite. Um, but uh, but you bring up a great point because that that did strike me the same way. And this is the gift that we've been given in terms of these outlets where we reach a broad audience and are introducing new generations to the profession and celebrating uh, to the old guys. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's really it is something that you and I uh, don't take for granted. Um, and we had this conversation when I was just getting off the ground. You're like, OK, here are the landmines you want to avoid and and don't go for the bright shiny object and so forth and so on and so yeah it's not something that we're going to trample on or, or take for granted and i know that you are a man of high character and ethics and there's some things that you just you won't go there because we've had these conversations i'm like hey i'm thinking of doing this you're like yeah have fun with that uh, i'm not gonna do that <laughs> i'm like okay well, our shows are a little we'll... different but not you know yeah. it's good yeah um so get to the mission Maverick is now leading it. Um, you know, obviously Hangman he thinks he's a lock. He doesn't, he's not a lock. Um, what I liked about that character was on the flight deck when they're manning up, he's like, give him hell. I thought that was a great, and they didn't hug, right? It wasn't too like gushy. Yeah. He just said, give him hell. Yeah. So I thought that was pitch perfect. Yeah, it was powerful. In terms of, of, of that, right? Yeah. Uh, and he wasn't bitter. I thought, Oh, this is great. Okay, cool. Right. It's just, it, it, it's like everybody's winning here, you know? Um, so I thought they could have gone other ways with that. And I thought the way they did that was right on. Um, and so then we get, we launch off, um, you know, for the record, the only guy who actually did flight ops was Tom Cruise. The rest of the actors did not get carry. any. Uh, yeah. Carrier ops. I'm sorry. That's what I meant to say. So um, some of the trailers, Jerry Bruckheimer says they all flew from the ship. No, they did not. The only guy who actually flew in that one cat shot, you see it, um, was uh, was Tom Cruise in the back of an F. And he does that great job where he pretends like he's holding a little handle, you know, so Tom it, it, it looks real to me. And his head kind of does the, uh, the thing at the end of the stroke there. Um, so four plane, immediate left turnout, boom, they're on their way. I think that was very cool. They do this. VLS Salvo, you know, they're shooting two dozen tomahawks. Yeah, but don't tomahawks fly about the same speed as a hornet? Yeah, that's the other thing, right? Because they're zorching overhead. Um, So they would be onesies and twosies, not that whole coven of of, uh, whatever you would call a collection of tea lamps. But that was kind of cool. And then they hit and Airboss like, there's no turning back now. Really? You could turn back at any time. I think that was no, it's fine. It? But anyway, yeah. yeah, there is go, no go. Um, yeah. But I thought this was all cool. Again, you have the thing about um, Iceman or Iceman. Um, Rooster's like, oh, I don't know if I can go fast. Tell me what to do, Dad. And he speeds up. And so Mav does the first miracle right on. Good job uh, to um, Bob, right? That's picture perfect. Blow the building up. And then the second one, as we already described, fanboys having dead eye, the gimbal thing, it's spinning uh, the flare pod. And, and so Rooster has to do a good old uh, manual drop, hits it just like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, right? The Death Star implodes, it does this, right? And now their troubles are just beginning as described because they pop out of the valley and now all the S-400s and other Sams are tracking them and so Sam's in the air, Max, Chaff, and Flares, dodging, evading, right? And so Can that I jump was all in okay. I mean, the sound that the, 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 the Expendables were making, I, I again, I've never heard it, but I don't think it sounds like that. Oh, but it sounded you know? cool. I mean, come on. It did sound cool. So the Foley guys, to use like a technical that. term, did their job. But, right. but hold on. Can I, can I say two things? Number one is they spent all this time so arduously flying in, like you said, Star Wars style, in the in – the, uh, trench to get there and then at the end after overstressing uh to go up the mountainside they're just gonna like okay well now we're gonna go up high no why wouldn't you pull over and come back down i don't know why they just allowed themselves to be now just picked out of the sky but i kind of liked the 
gosh, I don't know what to call it, but right. So someone's not coming home from this mission and he tells Hondo, it's been great. See you later. Right. So there's this foreboding, like someone's going to die. And then you get this scene where there's this music that you kind of feel, but you don't hear and you see missiles and everything just going crazy. And it's like, okay, this is it. I mean, they did their mission, but now they're all going to pay for it. And I thought that was very well done. Uh, I just didn't think from, again, from the point of view of real life, it was necessary to just go up there now. And, you know, by the way, you're super slow because you've just been going uphill. Um, but uh, just go back down if you can. And <laughs> go back down. down well. the same thing that got you there. But, but, but the emotion of that scene, I thought, was, was, was awesome. Right. Um, so, again, in terms of the guesswork that I did in previous What Happens episodes, I got the order wrong on who got shot down when. Because my guess, based on the last trailer, was Rooster gets shot down, when in fact it was Maverick, right? And and so that's this here. That's Maverick getting shot down. Um, so Mav's on the ground. Um, he's getting chased by this MI-24, kind of like a uh, Jurassic Park kind of thing. Well, well Star Wars, Wars, now we're in uh, Behind Enemy Lines. Yeah, meets... meets um, Jurassic Park, right? This kind of reminded me of the T-Rex, okay. um, the way it's chasing him down, right? So I saw it the first time in New York with a bunch of jaundiced members of the New York Entertainment Press, right? When that helo blew up, oh, again, hold it. Stand by, hold on. No notice spoilers coming at you. You've been spoiling the whole time, Mooch. I know. Put that thing I'm, I'm pretending like I've, I have I care. Um, so... Um, when that MI-24 blew up, I was like, fist pump, you know, Calvary's here. That was brilliant. And these New York press guys did the same thing. There was a cheer nice. in the theater, which did my heart good. Um, and so, long story short, Rooster's out of Expendables. He gets popped. He winds up on the ground. And then this was my favorite scene. When Mav's running for the parachute coming down, and he just <laughs> knocks Rooster on his ass. That looks so funny, right? He's like, I saved you. He's like, no, I saved you, and that sort of thing. And then Rooster gives him this, like, like <laughs> it was LOL funny. It was yeah. just a great scene. And then he's like, so what's the plan? And this part, to me, is fantastic. So let's just fast forward to they're in this hangar, this this you know, I guess you'd call it a revetted hanger. Shelter. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's a Tomcat. Has a huffer hooked up. Something that you never had to use. Nope. Huffer, air source, and electrical power. Right? So Mav's looking at the thing there. And he's like, okay, come here. So push this. And then when this happens, it hits 120 PSI. Then you do this. And so, um, again, the technical advisor on this piece, who we know, um, really did nail it, right? Because what this is basically is a cross country where the ground crew has no idea what they're doing. So the Rio gets to do all of the stuff that Rooster winds up doing, which is put the ladder up, you know, so pilot gets in, starts one of the motors, Rio puts the ladder up, pulls the huffer, close the huffer door, right? Again, the huffer is the thing that it blows air on the first stage of the turbine so that it'll get up to and DCS players know how to do this. Cause you have to do that to start the airplane in DCS. Um, you know, it was actually more RPMs on the B in the GE motor than it was on the TF 30. So this is an a with the old back seat, which I'll talk about in a second. So he pulls the pins on all the weapons, didn't pull the gear pins, but okay, let's just imagine he did that too. And then what did my heart good is he climbs on the horizontal stab and gets in the back seat. I have done this countless times on a, on a cross country. That's the way you get in the airplane once the ladder's put up. That's the Rio's way to get in the airplane, right? Canopy coming, and we taxi out to this damaged taxiway. Okay, so this is my main technical error piece, right? So they're on this damaged runway. But first, Rooster's like, he makes some comment. I'm blanking on what the exact verbiage is, but he's like, God, it's so old back here. It's museum piece. Yeah, it's this museum bag. piece, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, dinosaur. Was... And so that was my home, right, for 16 years. And it just looks super high tech to me. And he's looking at it like, 
what is this? Yeah. And so they don't have much takeoff distance. He winds up doing a no flap takeoff. Okay. You know how you minimize your takeoff distance. You drop the flaps. Okay. <laughs> so they do a no flapper, which is even not as much as good as doing a maneuvering flap takeoff. So they have three options. They chose the absolute wrong one. So hits this thing with the nose gear. So at that point, you probably fod both motors and you also wouldn't be able to get the gear up. Right. So gets the gear up. Now they're flying. Error number two in terms of Tomcat stuff. They fly around with the wings at 68 for most of this, the rest of the movie with this part, right? The wings are all the way aft. And then when he gets into the maneuvering thing, he moves them forward with the handle. Again, I think this is to your point of, it makes sense to an audience to see this guy go all MiG-23 with it and manually move the handle forward to where they would have been anyway if you had let the computer do the picking of the wing sweep angle. So that was all hosed up. But the best line in the movie in terms of me, Mooch the Rio was when he's like, I don't have a radar. The radios aren't working. He's like, there's all these circuit breakers back here, right? Cause you're like a cathedral organist in the backseat. You're surrounded by these circuit breakers. And generally if you could find it, and that's what the PCL, the pocket checklist had a whole like index in the back. It was like 10 pages of circuit breakers and you something wouldn't be working in the front seat. Like, Oh, I, I lost my, you know, canopy pressure, cycle the breaker. And you're like, okay, that's two E5 and you'd find it and you'd cycle it. Okay, it's working now, right? So in this case, it would be the UHF-2 radio isn't working. So like find a breaker. And Rooster's like, where is it? And Maverick says, this is the line I love. I don't know. That's what That was your dad's department, right? <laughs> that's what your dad used to do. I thought that was so perfect. Yeah. Right, a pilot would be so ignorant of what breaker it actually is, it would just start working because the Rio is back in the back seat working the gains, right? So, I love that line. And then suddenly things are working because he does actually put the breaker in, they can talk to home base. Another thing, um, so the airplane's all shot up, right? So, they work their way through two SU, well, hold on, yeah, two. So, he shoots down two of the SU 57s. Right. Again, that was a spoiler based on that trailer where you saw that thing doing that magic move, you know. Um, so let's just drop anchor here and talk about fifth gen versus Tomcat's what? Third gen? No, it's fourth. Technically. Fourth gen. Yeah. Um, so how did you like how that played out in terms of those two airplanes? Well, first off, I was convinced the SU-57s were real. I mean, they did such a good job with the texture of the reskinning of whatever it was before to turn it into an SU-57. In our next episode coming up on June 5th is with the aerial coordinator. So he talked a little bit about that and we'll hear that coming up. And so it looked very real and hey, someone's flying our Tomcat. It, it could be one airplane of ours that got airborne. Let's you know pull up and why isn't this guy responding? So that's the hand signals, right? And, uh, and so suddenly like, oh wait, you guys don't look normal. But by then you get the element of surprise. So he shoots one. And after that, I thought the uh, maneuvering they depicted was really cool. It was well done. Um, it was it was believable. Yeah. Again, the continuity part in this movie versus the first one. You know, if he's in a, a left turn and then they change the shot, he's still in a left turn. So it flowed in terms of how this dogfight. If you were had to draw it up, you could. The spaghetti would make sense, and the first movie mm -hmm. would make no sense. Um, and the comms weren't ridiculous, and um, also, Rooster knew the coolie hats were your expendables on the, the handle in the back seat. You have coolie hats that I don't know if he'd know that right off, um, but that's how you do your expendables. Um, and then you go Winchester on expendables, and now you're a grape. So they're getting shot up. And then attention, spoiler alert. Hold on. Let me do the banner. Okay. <laughs> they spoil um, the whole time, Mooch. <laughs> so Hangman comes in and picks off right when he's sweetening up the shot in the hut of the su-57 and then here comes wahoo right yeah um, well the missile actually starts coming out oh that's right so it just goes stupid i guess once the airplane oh, it gets blown up in the fireball yeah yeah oh okay okay yeah so now you know hoorah mav is an ace by the way at this point right x equals five so he's an ace fun fact um but then like the first one where 
the wingman is all shot up, but he does a flyby anyway, right? So you got to imagine hydraulics are, are, you know, combined sides to zero and, you know, every flight input is going to be maybe your last, but he has the wings fully aft and he does this bow to stern flyby. And now John, you have flyby, Mooch. yeah, you got to have your flybys, right? So cringe worthy, but cool visual. And now the air boss, the John Hamm cyclone character is playing the role of the coffee mug spill guy. So he's in the tower like, ah, oh, flyby. And he winds up. And this is another thing that we guessed at based on some of the intel from our good friend, Tyler Rogaway at the drive, um, where he spotted the airplane on the flight deck of the Theodore Roosevelt while it was in port. And they had the barricade stanchions rigged. So wind up doing a barricade recovery. And now it's just like the first one where flight deck crew, cheers, high fives, winks and nods to the tower. There's Warlock, always loved you. And Air Boss Cyclone's kind of like, I'm still not sure, but okay. Salute, right? Very cool, right? So, and then again, I wept when they had that final hug, right? I, I got it. I just, I, I, and the second time it was just this same emotion. And I don't know if it's the, because we're so, um, there's so much buy-in to these characters over all of these decades, right? Um, but it just worked. It, it wasn't corny or winceable. It was just, it felt sincere and, and really great. And, and so the end was moving to me and it, it yeah. did move me. No, I agree. I mean, right. This movie was full of so many different human emotions, redemption, closure, um, you know, all these different things. And so, right. There's this tension between rooster and Maverick the whole time. And now they have this speed movie type of uh, bonding experience. Right. And so now they're cool. And in fact, I'm so cool. I'm going to come help you change the spark plugs on your P-51. You know. <laughs> now I'm your son, the son you never had, right? Yeah. yeah. So F-14 Flyer says the reason we're weeping is because we're so old. Ah, okay. Good. I, I, I'm cool with that. Right. Uh, I, uh, for, to be fair, I, I've cried a lot more in the last year since I lost my brother. So I, I've yeah. definitely become oh, more. We're, we're sorry for that. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, just mentioned that you you lost your brother in a motorcycle accident, and uh, so yeah, you've you've had a rough one. So you're kind of like hair trigger uh, emotions this year, right. and so that's sure. especially if it's like you know masculine type of relationships. I mean, he was my best friend. Anyway, let's not go sideways. Um, hey, Mooch, I got a question for you. Pulled my papers. Now I didn't even get accepted to the academy in the first place, so I don't know. But how does a how does somebody just pull some applicants? papers to the Naval Academy, number one. And number two, why would it set him back four years? I didn't get into the Naval Academy. I went to UCLA and had a damn good time and showed up right next to the guys that were freshmen when I was freshman. Yeah. Uh, so blocked my entrance to the Naval Academy, as I pointed out in my first review, not a thing, right? So certainly a Terminal 06 doesn't have that kind of power. Okay. Um, your local congressman, if you're looking for that as your nomination source, might have that kind of power, you know, but then there are alternative ways to get in. You can go to prep school for a year. You, if you're a dependent, yeah. you get a presidential nomination. I think by the time I got in, it took me two tries. I had to go to prep school for a year before I got in. Um, and by the time I did get in, I had literally 12 nomination sources. Um, and, and so it was kind of overkill, right. but yeah, that's not a thing. And I like you, because when I saw it the second time, he's like, it, it helped me back for four years. It's like, so what did you do for those four years? <laughs> Cry. Right? But all right. Well, I put myself on a report for not watching your other review. So my apologies. <laughs> well, um, but so, yeah, blocking, not a thing, cringeworthy in terms of how you get into the Naval Academy uh, kind of a thing. Sure. Um, and then ultimately, as you said, the last scene is while well, he walks into the um, hard deck bar um which penny benjamin is the proprietor it's like where's penny and like she went sailing and that's another kind of scene people are like why do they do that sailboat thing like i don't know just bonding you know um and and so so penny's gone sailing with her daughter and the fun guy who's running the bars like i don't know when she's gonna be back so like you said like the scene opens with he's got that socket wrench and he's tightening something on the uh the merlin engine on the p51 and here's rooster behind him now doing the same thing so that's very cool and he peeks through and there's the daughter 
you know, yeah. um, and then there's like picture perfect Penny Benjamin, um, you know, just she's she doesn't have to say a whole lot in this movie. She really does look great. Um, and uh, she's sitting next to a Porsche. So I guess she's done all right as the owner of the uh, uh, the hard deck. Charlie um, had a Porsche. So come on. OK, Roger. And again, like we're asking, where did Maverick get the money for this cool man cave with a P-51 on Terminal 06 money? I, I don't know. Like somebody saying maybe Bitcoin or he did well. We all know squadron mates who were sneaky rich, you know, um, they did invest in, in a great way. I knew a guy who was your average run in the middle of A6BM that owned a house in Monterey, um, you know, and so it's like, how did that happen? So when he was teaching at the postgraduate school, he lived in Monterey. So obviously he's not living on, you know, go for money. I might get in trouble for this possible answer, but was he ever married? Was she ever married? Yes, she was. Was Maverick ever married? Because if he wasn't, he'd have a lot more money. But uh, oh, okay, no, he was never married, but she (laughs) was. So you're right. Maybe the because there's that one line that he goes, "How's your father?" He's like, "He's in Hawaii with his wife." Yeah. Right. Um, So yeah, maybe maybe that's how that went down. Yeah. Um, if so he's, he's and in the final scene, over. yeah, right. Um, so he was smart, never got married. Um, and, uh, so I'm just saying <laughs> that explains how he has money is all we're saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Not making yeah. a choice, right. We're yeah. both happily married men. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and so the final scene, uh, is this fly the P 51 literally into the sunset. Right, aileron rolls and various views and Lady Gaga, the that works. First time I heard that song, I'm like, yeah, okay. But when I saw it on the big screen after the emotion of the end of the movie, it just absolutely works. But as I pointed out in the review episode, <clears throat> there are only two original songs in this movie. Yeah. Right. Um, there were ten in the first one. Um, and that's the economics of the music business these these days. Yeah. Um, but the two that are in the movie or the one during the dog fighting football scene, which is this movie's version of the volleyball scene right. um, by one Republic, a band I'm not terribly familiar with, but it's kind of a catchy tune. And then the last one is the lady Gaga song. So I'm going to give it a 9.7, right? I know your panel, the lowest score was 9.5, 9.7. No, nine. I look forward to seeing it over and over again, you know? Um, so, I, I I was not prepared for how much I like this movie. I'll be honest, you know. The first time I watched it, Mooch, was on May 4th at the screening here at North Island. And I sat down with all these virtual, if you will, filters of I'm going to look for this guy. I'm going to look for this scene. I want to see what happens here. So I didn't enjoy it. So I've definitely enjoyed it more since I've watched it. Um, but yeah, for those of us who have lived the life, there's just enough... I don't want to call them cringeworthy, but there's just enough liberties taken that for me, it does detract from it a little bit. But on the other hand, as we said at the top, and uh, we're just about out of time, is it's it's entertainment. And it was very, very realistic. I mean, they put people in the back, really went flying and really did these different things that they showed. And so it's believable. It's something you can enjoy. It wasn't overly in your face about any of the things that some people might find contentious, like different races or, or genders doing different things. They were all there, which they are in real life. And that's great. And they're doing their job and it doesn't matter who or what you are. It matters what you do. And so I thought the movie struck a good balance with all that and it's entertaining. And so, yeah, there's a few things we can spend over an hour picking apart, but it's a good movie and it deserves to be seen on the big screen. Absolutely. So if you're watching this, um, Apologies for the spoilers, but we warned you up front that we're going to do spoilers, right? Um, and I I submit that this context will make the movie even more, will make it better. Because um, I remember, Jello, you and I spoke right before you were about to see the movie, um, and you texted me on the way out. You're like, um, my expectations were maybe a little too high. But then the second and third viewings, now you're on board for the big win. Um, so... Uh, if you haven't seen this and you're watching this now and thank everybody for showing up on a, a Tuesday afternoon, not, not prime time necessarily. So appreciate everybody uh, showing up for this live stream as always, once we're done here, it'll be an episode of the channel. So you can come back and check it out over and over again. Um, Jello, you're a super busy guy. 
Appreciate your friendship over the years, your mentor mentorship as a YouTuber. And again, if you're not subscribed to Jello's channel, do not pass go. Do so now. And thanks for spending some time with us on this live stream. Oh, you're welcome, Mooch. You have done a great job with what little information I gave you. You have turned it into your own product here, and your numbers reflect that. You're doing great. It's fun to watch your rise. And so uh, I hope people who joined us today were entertained and hopefully informed about what was real and right and wrong. And certainly, I'm sure, Mooch, someone's going to say, oh, you didn't talk about the fact that uh, just putting out flares doesn't do anything for a radar-guided missile, let alone set it off or uh, whatever else. So I'm sure we missed some stuff. But hey, we're just a couple old timers who have some experience in this talking about what we saw and that we enjoyed it. And so, yeah, that, that is what it is. So we'll look forward to having you back on the channel when we need your particular expertise. And if I don't see you before Tailhook, I definitely look forward to seeing you at Tailhook this year. I'll be there. Um, at Reno. Um, that's where we always circle up. So again, thanks very much. You're welcome. So that'll do it for this live stream. As always, the Punk Trilogy is available where books are sold, including audiobook and Kindle now. Um, so uh, if you buy it at usni.org, use the discount code PUNKYT for 25% off. And in fact, the second audiobook, Punk's Wing, comes out today. Um, the first one was released last month. Second one comes out today. And then Punk's Fight will come out at the end of next month. So thanks, everybody, for your support. And as always, I look forward to talking to you guys again very soon. Thanks a lot.